Welcome to our live stream with Thomas Jefferson, interpreted by Bill Barker. Today, we're discussing Jefferson's time in Philadelphia during the Washington and Adams administrations. Share your questions in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Oh, my heavens, what a pleasure. Well, thank you for coming to visit once again uh, here in the city of Philadelphia. And what a pleasure to have the opportunity uh, to meet right here uh, in the parlor of the late John Todd. You may recall his wife was Dolly, Dolly Payne. And lamentably, when Mr. Todd passed away in the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, well, then Dolly, a uh, most um, upset and saddened widow, uh, went a few years uh, still living in Philadelphia before uh, she was introduced to the gentleman who would become her second cousin. And I think you know of whom I am referring to, uh, James Madison. Uh, that did not occur here in her house, the Todd house, uh, but rather it occurred at the, the tavern at Gray's Ferry. And they were introduced, oh, well, you may already know, um, uh, Mrs. Todd, the widow Todd, was introduced to Mr. James Madison by Aaron Burr. Hmm. Well, but citizens, what a pleasure that we are here. Rarely do people have the opportunity to visit at the Todd House, uh, right here on the corner of Fourth and uh, and um, let me see outside. It is Walnut Street that goes east west here. Uh, from us. It's been a time since I've been back in the city, but a pleasure to be here in your company and to reflect and reminisce. So I'm looking forward to your questions about the time that I enjoyed Philadelphia City uh, during the administrations of the late President Washington and President John Adams, predominantly through the 1790s. So uh, your first question. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, today we are talking about your time in Philadelphia um, uh, in the 1790s. So, uh, when did you exactly return to Philadelphia and why? Well, when I left Philadelphia uh, after our resolution for independence was voted upon and our Declaration of American Independence was voted upon, remember two separate dates, the resolution first on July 2nd, the true birthday of our nation. And then two late days later, our Declaration of American Independence voted upon on July 4th. I remained in Philadelphia through the summer, and then I took my leave of the city uh, in the early autumn. I came back to Virginia, uh, headed straight to Williamsburg, uh, began to work on the, well, the uh, Revisal of the Monarchical Code of Laws, upon which we were all born and brought up here in the former colonies of Great Britain. I would not return to Philadelphia until the late autumn of 1782. That is when I returned, and it was a sad time for me. My late wife, uh, Mrs. Jefferson, Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson, had passed away the previous September of 82. I never thought I would return to, to government, to public service, and I thank heaven for James Madison. Uh, he was the one who suggested that I return. So I did, uh, uh, taking up, if you will, um, uh, in our House of Representatives, uh, but coming up to Philadelphia uh, first to leave my daughters uh, in that city. Uh, I'm referring, of course, uh, to, to Martha uh, and Mary, though she was very, very young under the tutelage uh, of a teacher. And I took my residence at the boarding house uh, of Mr. Samuel and Mary House. <laughs> that was the name, uh, the house's boarding house. Uh, it was there at Fifth and High Street, or as they now refer to High Street, uh, at Market Street. Then I, I took leave of the city of Philadelphia in 1783, the early part. Uh, but I returned to Philadelphia uh, later that autumn. It was in December of 1783. Uh, that was when, coincidentally, I enjoyed a, a ride from Monticello uh, up along the Shenandoah River uh, there to where Mr. Harper uh, kept a, a, a house, a tavern, uh, at his ferry, Harper's Ferry, with the conjunction of the Shenandoah and the Potomac 
uh, River. Uh, my daughter and I, along with uh, James Hemmings, uh, then proceeded uh, through uh, to Maryland, uh, Tannytown and uh, Frederick, Maryland, uh, up to the old uh, Wagon Road or the Lancaster Pike, uh, eastward to Philadelphia once more. Uh, and then it was that next spring of 1784 that I found myself where our government was convened uh, in Annapolis. And that, of course, was where I was commissioned uh, to be our nation's second minister plenipotentiary uh, to the court of King Louis the 16th of France. Uh, I sailed that summer of 1784 to France. I did not return uh, to Philadelphia until uh, it was. 17 and 90. Uh, I was making my way up to New York City. That is where our government was convened uh, there in 17 and 90. And uh, I visited with Dr. Franklin in, uh, in Philadelphia City. I, I realized at the time of my visit that uh, he was on his deathbed. Uh, so I was one of the last to, to visit with him, though he remained of great influence to me uh, as I proceeded, uh, proceeded northwards. To New York City. And then after that, as you may know, our entire government removed itself to Philadelphia City, uh, there by law under our new Congress to be seated for 10 years as we had uh, ratified and voted upon the Residency Act uh, to build our nation's new capital midway between the northern and the southern states, uh, 100 miles up the Potomac River, uh, there at what we now refer to as Washington the District of Columbia. So um, I was uh, living in Philadelphia, the first in my capacity as Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Well, that is what the Department of State was known uh, initially as the Department of Foreign Affairs. Within a few months, uh, it became the Department of State. I, of course, uh, the very first Secretary of our Department of State, taking up uh, my residence in Philadelphia City again. Well, uh, Mr. Jefferson, that is Absolutely fascinating. Um, and when you got to Philadelphia, did you notice any differences in the people, the buildings, or the atmosphere uh, since you were last there? Well, if you're referring to the time that our government was in Philadelphia during the 1790s, oh, quite so. Oh, my heavens, the population uh, nearly, nearly doubled. Uh, as I recall, when I was visiting Philadelphia uh, in the early 1780s, uh, it was still a population of about 40,000 souls. But as I came back, in the early 1790s, well, then as it had become the capital of our nation, it increased in its population. Many new buildings being built about town. Uh, I still took up my lodgings there at the house's boarding house uh, at uh, at Fifth and uh, uh, at Fifth and uh, and Market Street, uh, and enjoyed living there for some time in my capacity as uh, as Secretary of State. Wonderful. Um, so where exactly in Philadelphia City um, were you living when you were Secretary of State? Well, as I said, at the at the boarding house uh, of Samuel and Mary House, her husband had passed away. And uh, so I think she enjoyed uh, me uh, living there. And I think more so her daughter, uh, Eliza, Elizabeth uh, House, uh, a charming young lady. Uh, she had married an Englishman by the name of Philip uh, Trist or Nicholas Trist, I, I believe, was her uh, late husband. And uh, they had a little boy, Horace Brows, uh, Hist, Trist was his name. So we became very good friends there at House's uh, boarding house. Excellent. Um, so uh, we have a question. Um, did any members of Monticello's enslaved community go with you to Philadelphia when you traveled there to be Secretary of State? Well, yes, as I, as I mentioned, well, yes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, James Hemmings accompanied me. Uh, he, of course, uh, had accompanied uh, my daughter, Mrs. Randolph, and myself to France when we sailed to France on behalf of our nation. And uh, he took up a great interest and pursuit uh, engaging in uh, French cuisine and many a delicious French recipe. Uh, he himself entered much of the fr recipes in French that we have in our family cookbook. He entered those into our family cookbook and became very sought after as, as a chef uh, 
and the Maitre de Hotel. Uh, so when we were in Philadelphia uh, during those early years, uh, we made a pact that uh, as he wished to be manumitted, that is, he wished uh, to be set free, that I would certainly welcome it if he would then instruct uh, his artistry in, uh, in French cuisine and as a chef uh, to another who could be uh, most successful in that capacity at Monticello, uh, let alone wherever I may travel, even in the office of Secretary of State and the later offices I held. And so he suggested his brother, uh, Peter Hemmings, might be the one to learn the arts of French cuisine. And with that, we made a pact uh, that James Hemmings would be manumitted. He was manumitted within the next, I believe it was next uh, three years, 17 and 96. Uh, back at Monticello, I, I fulfilled the obligation as I had promised him uh, for him to be manumitted and set free. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Um, can you tell us about some of your friends in Philadelphia or people that you perhaps visited with frequently? And did you make any new friends? Well, as I mentioned earlier, lamentably, Dr. Benjamin Franklin passed away in April of 1790. Our government was not yet seated for the 10 years uh, uh, during the 1790s. Uh, so when I returned and when many of us returned to Philadelphia to take up our government there, I would say amongst the many who became good friends uh, were Dr. Benjamin Rush, uh, Charles Wilson Peel. Oh, and I'll never forget and we should not forget that Dr. Rush became the good friend and confidant, not only of myself, uh, but later vice well, Vice President John Adams, later President uh, John Adams. And we three have maintained that friendship after all of these years. In fact, I will tell you that I truly believe it was Dr. Benjamin Rush more than any other who was influential in encouraging uh, both President Adams and myself to reconvene uh, our correspondence. Uh, Mr. Peel, Charles Wilson Peel, ever a uh, an accomplished artist, portrait artist, yes, uh, was also an accomplished man of scientific curiosity. And uh, he, of course, opened a museum uh, there on the second floor of the State House in Philadelphia, the State House that increasingly becomes known as Independence Hall. Peel's Museum uh, has become all of the rage. And uh, I certainly forwarded on to him that he might display in his museum uh, some of the curiosities and fossils that were sent to me uh, by Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant Clark on their later uh, expedition. Another gentleman who became a good friend, though I must admit he, he was of a Federalist political opinion, uh, was Mr. Bingham, uh, William Bingham. And uh, he became one of the wealthiest men in all of Philadelphia. And this by the end of our American Revolution. Uh, much of it because um, earlier as our American Revolution began, uh, Mr. Bingham uh, engaged a lot of what you might call um, mercenary ships, uh, uh, engaging letters of mark to hire mercenaries to capture British ships, uh, to take them as prizes, and to bolster the support of our forces uh, during the American Revolution. Uh, Mr. Bingham uh, later, of course, was influential in, in the founding of the university out in Carlisle, of Pennsylvania. Uh, he supported its founding, uh, named, of course, for our mutual friend, uh, John Dickinson, Dickinson uh, College out yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that a good friend uh, with whom I became acquainted during my very first trip to Philadelphia, remember I was 23 years old, 1766, when I went there to be inoculated against the smallpox, uh, was a Latin teacher at that time, uh, his name Charles Thompson, and uh, he later became uh, the headmaster of the uh, Friends uh, Central School, or the, the Central Academy. It, it has become known as it was chartered by the, uh, Governor William Penn as the William Penn Charter School. Uh, but this was not before uh, Mr. Thompson became the secretary uh, of our Continental Congress. Uh, from the very beginning, 1774, throughout the founding of the first Congress of our nation in 1776, and he continued as the secretary uh, of our nation's Congress uh, 
through the very first Congress under our Constitution. And then he uh, took leave and retired, uh, went to live at his country estate known as Harrington. Uh, I would often go out and visit him uh, there uh, in those Quaker lands uh, out in western uh, Philadelphia. So he remained a good friend. I believe we have talked about um, uh, Monsieur Peter uh, Stephen Dupont Chaux. Uh, uh, he, of course, became a good friend of mine. He was the military attache for General von Steuben and had accompanied von Steuben here uh, as von Steuben, of course, uh, uh, drilled our troops wonderfully that they may be the more equipped to engage battle. Uh, Monsieur Dupont Chaux uh, stayed on after our victory. Uh, he became a secretary of the Department of State. I would see him nearly every single day as I attended to office in my capacity as, as Secretary of State. And uh, then he read law, became quite, quite an accomplished attorney in Philadelphia, a renowned member of the American Philosophical Society. He remains my friend as the two of us continue uh, to uh, more or less uh, pursue interests in creating a dictionary of many native languages uh, in our continent. I think more than anyone else right now, Monsieur Dupont Chaux of the American Philosophical Society, with whom I've been well acquainted uh, from the time after our American Revolution, uh, is foremost in that study uh, of the native languages of our, our continent. Well, thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, we have a question uh, from Chris, um, and he is asking um, what your thoughts are on Alexander Hamilton, who at the time was serving as Secretary of State, um, and what was your opinion on Hamilton's views for setting up a bank for the United States? Now, Chris, do you not think that this uh, most pleasant day uh, out of doors, let alone uh, here within the uh, beautifully appointed parlor, uh, of the late Mr. John Todd, uh, why should we bring into discussion, if you will, such a, well, um, uh, a controversial time in our early nation's history? And I will not deny it was perhaps far more controversial when our government was in New York, uh, because that was uh, witnessed the crux of the arguments uh, between the late General Hamilton and myself over his banking bill, uh, and let alone his um, assumption bill. Uh, this, of course, being argued and debated at the same time we were arguing the Residency Act. Where shall we situate uh, the capital of our nation? Should it be in New York? Uh, should it be in Philadelphia? Uh, should it be in Trenton, New Jersey, or Lancaster, Pennsylvania? Well, happily, happily, and I emphasize happily, uh, General uh, Hamilton and myself, were able to come to an agreement. It, it was Mr. Madison we had to influence, and happily indeed we did when we invited him to a dinner uh, at my quarters. Uh, that was still in New York. I was residing at 57 Maiden Lane, and uh, there over dinner, General Hamilton and I finally convinced Mr. Madison uh, that a compromise was necessary to save our nation. Otherwise, it would have all imploded. Uh, and that compromise recognized the necessity of uh, Hamilton's Assumption Bill, the necessity of a national bank in order to direct and then administrate the payment of our national debt. Uh, of course, he told me, Hamilton, right there at the dinner, I, I wrote it down, said that uh, that debt would be paid off within about four years, if I recall. And uh, of course, looking back uh, in his comments, uh, in what I call my annus there, a, a recording of conversations that I've had, uh, I have now realized in retrospect, uh, he had no idea to pay it off within four, let alone five or six years. That was something that he desired would remain in its effect, particularly with the banking bills substantiating uh, our nation's national bank for, for 20 years. Uh, you could say that when we moved our government to Philadelphia City, that this continued to resonate. And, and it did, because remember that uh, uh, our federal constitution had been voted on. It had been adopted with the Bill of Rights, I'm happy to say. Uh, and so the question, if you will, of the, the strength of a federal government presuming over all of the states uh, remained. And uh, particularly at the time when I was vice president in 1798, and, uh, and President Adams uh, sought fit to initiate the uh, Alien and Sedition Acts. But that, that is something that I hold contest with. Uh, well, no, I'm not even going to get into it uh, again. But um, 
uh, General Hamilton was not so much uh, concerned with it. Now, I'm not going to deny as well that I was a bit perturbed with the whiskey tax, uh, and that was something that General Hamilton uh, certainly uh, believed was necessary, and uh, I was opposed to it. I, I could not believe that our federal government would ad uh, administer a tax that would have to be paid by the common man, the common farmer who uh, of necessity must engage distilling as something that might be a viable uh, commodity uh, throughout the vagaries of the seasons and the crops, while bartering amongst farmers uh, is the foundation of their political economy. Uh, one farmer having one crop uh, that would be useful, another another crop that would be useful, that they barter and trade back and forth. It is distilling whiskey that is is always a constant. So uh, I was very much opposed to that uh, that whiskey tax, uh, as you know the. The distillers in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia could readily play that, pay that tax as they distilled hundreds, if not thousands, of barrels of whiskey. But what did it amount to? It amounted uh, to naught, if you will, because uh, President Washington, uh, donning his uniform of rank once again with General Hamilton astride his horse to his right, ventured out with an army to do battle uh, with the farmers in western Pennsylvania. And when they arrived, I think you know the result. Uh, there were no farmers there to greet them. The farmers went back to their business, farming. And uh, so that would probably be something with which I continued to disagree at the time. Now, I, I, as I continue to speak overly long, I'm reminded of something else that did come up. And uh, perhaps I should fess up to it. Um, in my capacity as, um, as Secretary of State in the early 90s, uh, Mr. Thomas Paine, uh, and his felicitous pen, uh, penned uh, another a work that was published known as The Rights of Man. Uh, it was shown to me by Mr. Madison, and I was absolutely and immediately taken to it, because with the respect for the common man, this would be the appropriate answer to some of the chicanery that was going on in our federal government then, as it was moving to Philadelphia, uh, adhering itself to the influence of the counting houses. And so after Mr. Madison showed me uh, Mr. Payne's pamphlet, I decided it needed to be published, published immediately in our nation's newspapers. And at the time, the, the Harrison Smiths were very good friends for me, Samuel Harrison Smith and, uh, and Margaret Bayard Smith, his wife. So I suggested that uh, Harrison Smith ought to uh, print Payne's pamphlet. And, and I wrote inside the, the front page of Payne's pamphlet to Mr. Smith, publish this so that the common man uh, may indeed become well acquainted again with good common sense. Adopt once more good common sense, a play, of course, on Payne's first public pamphlet. Well, Mr. Harrison Smith uh, published my comment uh, along with uh, Mr. Payne's pamphlet. And so it was time, as Mr. Madison said, we both, uh, get out of town. And so it was during that spring of 1791 that uh, that Mr. Madison and I took a trip up to the northern lakes throughout New England. Uh, uh, we had somewhat of a botanical excuse. Uh, it was to study the Hessian fly and its destruction uh, of our corn crops. But it also had a political, uh, political attention, and that was Vermont was entering uh, our nation as a new state, our 14th state, so we decided to ascertain the sensitivities, political sensitivities of Vermonters. Uh, I dare say at the time that uh, General Hamilton was somewhat uh, uh, offended by the publication of, uh, of the rights of man. Well, Mr. Jefferson, thank you for that elaborate answer. Yeah, um, lengthy indeed, well, and that's the short answer. <laughs> indeed. Um, so it, it's clear you had a lot on your mind in Philadelphia. You were engaged in uh, a lot of work. Um, but I have to ask, uh, of everything you did in Philadelphia at this time, people are curious to know, uh, what work did you enjoy the most? Hmm. Hmm. I would say that during those 1790s that I was in Philadelphia, uh, that I enjoyed presiding over the patent department. Uh, as I was Secretary of State, the Patent Department fell under uh, 
uh, that particular office. And so immediately, I will tell you, I'm delighted to see so much the result of the ingenuity of the American mind uh, uh, enter into my chambers. And I mean that literally. Uh, the various drawings and models uh, had to be accommodated only in my 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 residence where I was living, and and I could not accommodate them any better than to put them on top of bureaus, uh, into bureau drawers, uh, put them underneath the the bedstead, uh, and the like. So discovering the ingenuity of the American mind to to be able to to commission, if you will, so many individuals the right to their own genius of their own mind for a good 50 years that they could benefit from it, as well as the American people, let alone the world, it was a great pleasure and interest to me. I'll never forget commissioning, if you will, Mr. Whitney, Eli Whitney, on his ingenious invention of a cotton gin. Um, I remember President Washington procured one. I certainly did, uh, but I doubt they'll, they'll amount to much. I mean, I have to say that. I only cultivate a small acreage of cotton, as, as you may know. But someday it could come very much into its kingdom. Uh, but I enjoyed that. I enjoyed being a, a member and then president of the American Philosophical Society uh, to further inspect curiosities uh, in nature. The Megalonyx, uh, for instance, the Greek ground sloth. Uh, what was it precisely like? When did it live? Uh, pursuing curiosities in uh, fossils and, uh, and that they represent something that is rather novel. Uh, in the human mind, and that is simply, as many believe the earth is only 4,000 years old, that uh, the fossils are wont to purport that our earth is much, much older uh, than that, and has seen many curious forms of life, much more grand than we have seen uh, in our own natural world. Uh, I mentioned working with Monsieur Duponchot, uh, on studying various Indian dialects, uh, pursuing, if you will, an alphabet, perhaps, of the Cherokees, that they might be foremost uh, in that effort. Uh, I enjoyed, during the time that uh, I was vice president, uh, working on a parliamentary manual, uh, a parliamentary procedure. Now, this was a curiosity, and the reason I say so, we never forget, as we founded our nation, we were founding a nation in complete opposition uh, to the parliamentary procedure of monarchies. Something completely opposed to the parliamentary procedure, if you will, of totalitarian or authoritarian governments. Ours is a government devoted to the inherent rights of the individual. Ours is a government that I set out uh, in the prescription of rules in the House of Representatives, rules in the Senate, uh, to substantiate, if you will, honesty over force. We cannot in our nation subjugate ourselves to the continued tumults and calumnies of European kingdoms that engage force over the governing of man. And thank heaven nature has allowed us 3,000 miles of ocean as a separation between uh, those ancient kingdoms and our new world order here uh, of self-government. So working on the parliamentary procedure substantiated a system of rules a system of procedure and rules which protects the minority. Is that not what rules are for in government? To protect the minority uh, from anything that could be devised by a majority in the majority's favor. So this occupied a great deal of my time, became a great pleasure uh, to draft this parliamentary uh, manual. I, I wrote to Mr. George Wythe, under whom I read law. I wrote to Mr. Edmund Pendleton, who was on the committee I mentioned earlier, to revise the monarchical system of law under which uh, I was born, that they might help and be of support in this parliamentary manual. Now, I will tell you that uh, in all of that work, uh, while I was vice president and presided over the Senate, that it would not ultimately be published and be of use to our nation uh, until our government removed itself to Washington City. But that was a pleasure of mine during those latter years in Philadelphia City. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, we have a question from Kelly. Uh, they're curious, uh, how did you feel uh, telling wa uh, President Washington that you'd be resigning as Secretary of State? Well, Kelly, I knew I was keeping my promise. That's sincerely how I felt. And I knew that the general was a man of integrity. He certainly was. 
and, and that therefore he would understand in submitting my resignation as Secretary of State that I was holding to my promise. And the promise I made was very simply that when I visited him at Mount Vernon to encourage him to stand for a second term as our nation's chief magistrate, something that he did not want to engage. He had had enough after four years, and rightly so. Consider all that he had done in winning for our nation uh, that American revolution. Uh, but as I said to him, the North and the South rest upon your shoulders, looking ever to your head for our continued guidance. So he extracted a promise from me. He said, if I do so, if I do so, will you kindly remain as my Secretary of State? I promised him that I would, and he understood that. I often wondered whether he asked the same promise of General Hamilton to remain as our Secretary of the Treasury. And I think he understood as he was reelected and took on that second term that the differences of opinion between General Hamilton and myself simply would not end and would not cease. I, I know he counted on my promise, but I think, I think what happened not only was the acute divisiveness uh, occurring within our government during those years in Philadelphia, the political platforms that began to, to, to grow, I'm referring to those becoming known as Federalists, uh, General Hamilton ever uh, as their, their leader, and then the opposing political platform becoming known as the Anti-Federalist, and I will not deny I uh, became known as, as their uh, particular leader, that this was disrupting our government at the same time we were besieged with the yellow fever. The yellow fever came into the midst of these arguments. And this was at the same time when we knew General Washington would not stand for a third term, that he would decidedly step down in 1796, that all of this collectively, I think, uh, bore great weight uh, on the shoulders of General Washington, so that when I then decided in the summer of 1793 that I should not care to be responsible for any further uh, disputes or uh, uh, arguments and distaste in the president's cabinet that it would be best for me to resign, that though he understood my promise, I think he understood the reason why I should take leave. And, uh, and so it was, I remained in Philadelphia. I came back to Monticello first, but then came back to Philadelphia. Uh, and remember, our government had to go into quarantine. We moved to Germantown, several miles uh, northwest of Philadelphia uh, during that yellow, those yellow fever months in late 1793. Uh, but then, at the end of December, uh, I stayed but a few days more uh, through early January in Philadelphia and resigned entirely uh, from our government. And I thought that was it. I thought that was the, the end of my, uh, my public life. Uh, but as you know, it certainly was not. Uh, several years later, but two or three years later, in 1796, I was called out of retirement uh, to stand for the office of president, this time in opposition uh, to my old friend, uh, John Adams. So I think it was the promise that he understood well, took me at my word, but I think even though you could say I broke that promise that he still understand, uh, stood many of the reasons why. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, we uh, have a question uh, to something you alluded to. Um, so you discussed the, briefly the yellow fever. Uh, we now know that in the 18th century, uh, Philadelphia would deal with yellow fever outbreaks almost every summer. Um, how did you personally deal with yellow fever? Well, as I mentioned, and yes, I did allude to it, uh, not only myself, but many uh, felt the necessity, first and foremost, uh, as we had no idea where it was coming from, many thought it was because of the, the flies that gathered uh, uh, within the waters, the mosquitoes that gathered within the waters, collected on the top of barrels uh, that... Uh, uh, were coffee barrels shipped up from the, the Gulf of Mexico and South American companies, uh, countries shipped up to Philadelphia City that these flies, these mosquitoes might have something to do with it or maybe it was simply the rancid coffee. Now, coffee has ever been one of my favorite drinks. I consider it the drink of the civilized world. Uh, but this was an occasion where we just simply could not uh, 
uh, tamper with it or allow ourselves to play host uh, in passing the disease to one to another. So we would wrap up uh, and, and stay at a distance. I mentioned our government went into quarantine. We moved the entire government up along Germantown Avenue there uh, in Germantown. That's even where I went to live uh, at that time. Um, I had been living, coincidentally, to escape uh, the yellow fever, to escape the pestilence of heat and humidity in the center city of Philadelphia, uh, to a, a beautiful building that was situated on the east bank of the Schuylkill River uh, near Grace Ferry, across from where the Bartrams have their uh, delightful gardens. And, uh, and yet, uh, I needed to move back to Philadelphia when the government went back there uh, in the later autumn of 1793, and that, of course, before I, I resigned from office. So uh, I tended to bear up to it, as so many did, without any knowledge of where it was coming from, by simply staying a distance and uh, uh, bearing, if you will, a handkerchief across your mouth and daring not to, to touch or shake hands. And here I am the one who introduced the handshake as an element of, uh, of public greeting. I, I believed it is far more diff uh, intimate method of greeting than the courtly bell that we have been brought up to as somewhat British manners. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Very interesting. Um, so you talked about uh, your time as vice president to your old friend, John Adams. Mm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like to be the vice president? I'm not going to say that those uh, I look back upon as the happiest of my entire life. I mean that in the office. I mean that in the office. Uh, I um, had to submit uh, to the rules and the laws in our Constitution as it was originally written and, and still, still bore up at that time in 1796. To wit, whoever receives the second highest number of votes in a presidential election uh, then <laughs> becomes vice president. And, uh, and so I suffered it, suffered it for four years. And I was not a, a silent vice president. I was, I was neither silent by voice nor was I silent by pen. I wrote in opposition to Mr. Adams' administration. I did not care for how we were treating uh, our former ally, the French. Uh, I, I did not care for the increasing influence, if you will, of the Federalist faction devoted to the influence of the counting houses. Uh, I did not care later on, as you well know, uh, to the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, which were absolutely imposed upon us by that federal government. And, uh, and I spoke out and wrote out. It's, it's not generally known, but so did Mr. Madison, uh, the two of us in our resolutions. Uh, Mr. Madison's Virginia resolutions, my Kentucky resolutions. And uh, so this took place during my vice presidency in that, those years, 1798 uh, and on. Now remember, and happily so, uh, these were acts, which meant that they would retire. I think there were 18 months uh, and they did finally retire, but that was the whole point of the act uh, being put forth by Adams' administration. They would retire on the 3rd of March, 1801, the day before the next presidential inauguration. So the acts were meant to secure uh, the federal government in the hands of the Federalist Party, to secure uh, the administration of President Adams, particularly for the possibility of his reelection in the presidential election, 1800. Uh, and so... Uh, as you know, in that next presidential election, 1800, uh, I was welcomed by the anti-federalist faction to oppose my own president. So you could say it was no different than as I opposed him uh, four years earlier in 1796. But it was different because this time there were two other candidates for that high office. And uh, not one of them was a vice presidential candidate. We would not have the 12th Amendment until 1804. So there were four men vying uh, with one and the other for that high office. So therein you see the result of what those four years as vice president uh, came up to uh, when I stood again opposed to President Adams. And as you know, uh, this time I was ultimately the victor and President Adams would not have a, a second term. So um, I look back on that uh, uh, without uh, very fond of uh, reminiscences in the politics being played out. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Um, so uh, when 
did you leave Philadelphia for the last time? When was the last time you were there? And do you have any interest to return in the future? Well, first and foremost, I would ever have an interest to return to, to Philadelphia City. It was the Athens of our nation at that time. Uh, there was always a question as to whether the Port of New York would own up in its business uh, to the city of Philadelphia, supersede the city of Philadelphia in its business and in its cultural uh, uh, associations and societies. Uh, one could hardly believe it during the 1790s, as Philadelphia was so much the center of uh, the continuing growth of our nation uh, and the influence of our, our federal government the center of the arts, the center of music, if you will, the museums that were already there, the institutions of higher learning, uh, let alone the Quaker schools that had always been there, uh, accepting uh, poor as well as wealthy female, as well as male students. So yes, I, I would ever be interested to return to the city of Philadelphia uh, and to meet with those that I had known uh, in my early life. I, I wonder whether indeed uh, Mr. Thompson is still well out at Harriton. Uh, but citizens, I, I will tell you, I cannot forget my last visit to Philadelphia because it was with the knowledge that we would be removing our government uh, that ensuing spring. I left Monticello to travel to Philadelphia City uh, in the autumn of 1799 and accompanying me uh, was Jupiter Evans. Uh, we've spoken many times about Jupiter uh, Jupiter, of course, uh, delivered the summary view of the rights of British America, which I wrote at Monticello and yet could not bring to Williamsburg because I fell ill. I handed uh, those jottings to Jupiter Evans and he rode those five days to Williamsburg and there had them printed by Mrs. Clementina Ryan in pamphlet form. It was that pamphlet then brought to Philadelphia and introduced to the first Congress, September 1774, uh, through which I became renowned as a writer. Well, Jupiter, if you will, accompanied me to, to Philadelphia City at late autumn of 99. And as we set out from Monticello, it was quite clear that he was not feeling well. Uh, by the time that we arrived in Fredericksburg, uh, he had fallen more to uh, whatever malady he was suffering, had a very high fever, and he had to be put to bed. Uh, we put him to bed there uh, at a tavern, and uh, I bought a blanket for him. I, I bought uh, some medicine for him, and I became concerned that he could not possibly accompany me any farther uh, to Philadelphia, suggesting that he return to Monticello as I proceeded on. And, uh, and so he did uh, return finally to Monticello. I learned later that he continued ill. Uh, he learned that there was a, a doctor of his particular color that could administer perhaps a curative. Uh, that doctor lived down where my brother, Randolph De Jefferson, resided across the James from Scottsville. Uh, they had Snowden Plantation. So I learned that Jupiter went down to Snowden and uh, this particular doctor gave him a potion, uh, which many uh, remember the doctor saying would either kill him or cure him. And, uh, and lamentably, uh, it succeeded in the former. Uh, not before Jupiter uh, suffered greatly in spasms and antagonisms. Uh, as I wrote my daughter, Mary, uh, none could possibly replace him. We have lost a member of our family. I lament to, to think that, uh, that Jupiter had no opportunity to venture with me to, to Washington City. Uh, I would, would have so much appreciated his company as I had for so many, many times from my early youth. So as I reflect upon that last trip up to the city of Philadelphia, it is not without uh, its degree of sadness. Uh, and so citizens, if you will, having enjoyed this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, uh, our beloved city of Philadelphia, which saw the birth of our nation uh, and saw our first established government there uh, under the Constitution for a period of 10 years as we were building our new capital at Washington City, uh, that these reflections and reminiscences may be a clarion call for the many of us. Uh, 
to return and visit there and reflect on our extraordinary city uh, in that Quaker city, truly, devoted to brotherly love, devoted to the freedom for religion, devoted to the pursuit of education, and devoted, if you will, uh, between uh, uh, English and German Quakers, uh, the first slave emancipation society uh, here in, in our nation. So uh, I see that uh, our time now is drawing nigh, and um, I should perhaps uh, delight to venture out of doors now uh, along uh, Walnut Street, perhaps um, to venture down uh, several blocks westward uh, to that Walnut Street Theater. Uh, that was begun during the last year uh, of my presidency, 1809. Uh, it was actually a horse circus for some time, but now I understand uh, is uh, prominent in welcoming uh, its seat filled with uh, standing room only uh, behind uh, for most foremost uh, presentations uh, in theater and the like. So perhaps I may see you there. Uh, perhaps, uh, if you will, I will see you at El Monticello. But ever, wherever we meet, I will remain your humble and obedient servant. Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.